Okay, everyone, I think we're just about ready to begin here. Okay, good morning, everybody. Um, I'm pleased to support today's media availability. I just want to thank everybody for taking the time to join us today for this. Um, we've had a significant number of media requests over the last week related to ICU and acute care, as well as our usage of the pediatric intensive care unit as part of that surge, and also our surgical slowdowns and more. Now, we certainly appreciate the importance of these questions, but it has become a bit of a challenge for us uh, to take our leaders away from this work due to many one-off requests. So, in order to maintain capacity for our leaders to be able to provide you with these comments while continuing to lead this work operationally, we've set up this opportunity for you to have those questions answered in a Q&A format. Uh, joining us in order to take your questions today, we have Dr. Susan Shaw, our Chief Medical Officer, Derek Miller, Commander of our Emergency Operations Center, and Lori Garchinsky, our Executive Director of Provincial Services Tertiary Care. Before we get into the Q&A session, Derek and Dr. Shaw would like to begin with some opening remarks. Uh, so go ahead whenever you're ready, Derek. Thank you, Amanda, and good morning, everyone. Thank you for coming together to support us in addressing your many questions all at once here this morning. Before we get into answering your questions, there are a few points I'd like to share regarding our surge plans and activation status. Overall, our latest targets we shared with you last week remain unchanged. We're still working towards a goal of needing to care for 125 ICU COVID patients and 350 COVID acute care patients within the next number of weeks. However, each week as an emergency operations centre, we look more specifically at what may be to come for the next 7 to 14 days based on current cases and trends, and we work with our teams on a specific two-week outlook. This outlook is shared internally, so teams know what space and staff they need ready for when we anticipate that demand. Then we monitor what is happening across the province to evolve our plans as needed for the next week. That is how our projections work and why they are shared in various forms. It is really a planning tool to ensure capacity is maintained within our facilities to meet demand. Right now, we know that over 70% of our ICU beds are being used to care for a single preventable disease, COVID. And at the same time, we need to ensure we have 50 ICU beds staffed to care for non-COVID patients who are not in control of needing critical care. For this week, we have advised teams the overall targets hold and to continue to implement full slowdown of all ele elective procedures without delay and activate all additional approved slowdowns. We need teams provincially to level load to manage demand and fill the various human resource gaps. We are currently utilizing the pediatric ICU in Saskatoon for some adult patients. Currently, we have added and staffed an additional 36 adult medicine beds in Saskatoon and 22 beds in Regina. This will assist us in supporting anticipated incoming COVID demand along with service slowdowns across the province. It is important to recognize that with service slowdowns, we, we will be and are caring for COVID patients in spaces and with staff who would otherwise have been providing other health services. Right now, we have 30 hospitals across the province who are staffed caring for more than 200 acute care non-ICU COVID patients. That is why service slowdowns are so important to our surge response. We need our current spaces and staff to be able to care for COVID patients while maintaining safe care for our incoming non-COVID patients. So for this week, our overall surge target remains. We are seeing demand for COVID care shift from Saskatoon in the north to include rural areas and Regina. These types of changes in demand are an important factor in ensuring we mobilize a provincial response, the surge area as we've seen, can change quickly. We hope new public health orders and changes in behavior are starting to have an impact on case volumes, but we also know demand has not eased overall. As a system, we will do our best to be there for when you need us, 
but we need you to help us make that happen. No one can predict for sure what will come longer term because this is all complete, completely dependent on the behavior of Saskatchewan residents. So I urge everyone to follow the new public health orders, wear your mask, and most of all, if you are eligible, please get vaccinated as soon as possible. I'm going to turn over to Dr. Shaw for some further comments on the importance of vaccination and what we are seeing in our ICUs. Thanks, Derek, and good morning, everyone. I want to build on Derek's current comments that encourage everybody to get vaccinated. Unfortunately, what we are all facing is controllable and preventable. Nearly 84% of all new infections and hospitalizations in our province in August were in unvaccinated or partially vaccinated people. A recent analysis of over 1,600 diagnosed infections show that 98% of school-aged children with COVID live in households with unvaccinated or partially vaccinated parents. People who have chosen to remain unvaccinated are six times more likely to test positive, six times more likely to be hospitalized, and 12 times more likely to be admitted to an intensive care unit. More than 70% of our ICU patients are admitted fighting for their lives due to a single preventable diagnosis, severe COVID pneumonia with lung failure. We now have enough inpatients from COVID to fill both the Swift Current and Prince Albert hospitals combined. And the numbers of hospitalized patients are growing rapidly, all that pressure from a single preventable disease. If everyone who is eligible for a vaccine got both doses, we would be able to manage the demand. Instead, we are facing service slowdowns that Derek spoke to, and this is having a real impact on the quality of life and health for many across Saskatchewan, and it will result in real harm. But worse, if this continues, the life-saving supports all Saskatchewan citizens rely on will be in danger. The highly skilled healthcare personnel we rely on day in and day out for those services are a finite resource. I work in the ICU and it's already heart-wrenching to watch people die from a largely preventable disease. And to add to that heartache, any need to make decisions about life-saving care for all of Saskatchewan residents only build and add to that tragedy. So please, if you are not yet vaccinated and are eligible, please say yes. Ask good questions of your family physician, your pharmacist. Challenge all the misinformation that is swirling around and causing real harm to so many of us. And if you are fully vaccinated, please encourage others to do so as well. Help them to find good information and a vaccine clinic. Thank you. Please, as always, stay safe. And I'm gonna hand it back to Amanda now to help moderate questions. Thanks, Dr. Shaw. Thanks for your comments and also you as well, Derek. Um, before we begin the Q&A session, I just want to begin with some housekeeping notes. Um, if you have a question, we ask that you please click the hand icon by your name. You'll be called on when it's your turn. Your line will be unmuted and you'll get one question as well as one follow up question. Alternatively, you can ask your question in the chat box. You can type it in there and it will be read aloud on your behalf when it's your turn. We have a number of people on the line, so we ask that you please limit yourself just to one question and one follow-up question just to make sure we can give everybody an opportunity here today. If there is still time at the end and you have a third question, you can use that hand icon and we'll do our very best to accommodate you. Also, in order to make sure that we're allowing our leaders to get back to their urgent work related to pandemic response, we're gonna do our very best to cap the Q&A to about 20 minutes, and we thank you for your support in that. So with that said, we'll now begin uh, Linnell, do we have any questions on the line? Oh, we do, Amanda. The first one's from Nathaniel Dove. Nathaniel, go ahead. Hi, can you hear me okay? Yes, we can. Okay, thank you. Uh, Dr. Shaw, you previously said that doctors, frontline healthcare workers are coming very close to having to use ethical frameworks to decide who gets medical care in the overcrowded ICUs. Are we there now? Are people receiving suboptimal care because you're overwhelmed and need to make tough choices? I think the people who are currently in our intensive care units are getting really high quality care. It's the people that we've had to choose to not do their surgeries because they've needed an intensive care unit bed for part of their post-operative care. 
are the people that I know um, are not getting the care that they were waiting for. And so I think that already is one of those allocation decisions that we've needed to make. And we make those when we're in stage one of the allocation framework. As numbers continue to grow, we will continue to try to expand our ICU capacity as best as we can. But the finite resource are skilled healthcare personnel who work in uh, the team that provides care to the ICU patients. So as we grow and expand the team, um, the, the, the models of care do need to shift. And at that point, um, I do think that what we're doing is, um, it's not the usual standard of care. It's still gonna be high quality. It's still gonna be safe. It's just gonna be different. Thanks, okay. Dr. Shaw. Nathaniel, did you have a second follow-up question? Uh, yes, now we know adult patients are being transferred uh, to the children's units. Uh, are adult COVID patients in any other units right now? And does this put Saskatchewan children at risk? Well, I'll start and I think uh, Lori Garchinsky will um, be better uh, positioned to add some uh, and to build on my answer. So right now our critical care patients are being looked after in the ICU, adult ICUs across the province. And then I'm also very grateful that we have um, our pediatric intensive care unit team who actually stepped forward and said, we have capacity, we think we have the ability, we know, and I know they have the ability to take care of selected patients either with or without COVID. And we do have several um, people who would traditionally, they are called adults and they would be traditionally in our ICUs, but a part of the team response, I'm very grateful that our PICU team is balancing, always making sure that there's space and expertise available for children all across the province. And then with the additional space that they um, currently have and the additional capacity, they are taking selected patients. Lori, I imagine you would have something else to say in answer to that question. Yeah, thanks so very much, Dr. Shaw. Um, appreciate the question. Uh, Nathaniel, to your point as well, um, the PICU takes very seriously their responsibility to dealing with children. And uh, we have not seen a significant amount of impact in pediatric patients, gratefully, uh, that are requiring PIC resources. But our goal is always to ensure and the responsibility of making sure that children of Saskatchewan have access to the PIC. To Dr. Shaw's point, um, when we began some of the planning for surge capacity, uh, as mentioned, our PIC partners did step up to the plate and said that uh, they definitely would work with our adult intensivist colleagues and where appropriate select adults that could be adequately cared for in that PICU. I would just add that uh, one of the other surge plans um, is the fact that in Regina, there are intensive care patients being cared for in the cardiac care unit and we have been able to support um, surge capacity for those cardiac care units in other places. It really is a bit of sh shuffling the deck in terms of being able to make sure that we have access as much as possible along with that infinite um, human resource capacity that Dr. Shaw spoke of. Thanks for that, Lori, and thanks, Dr. Shaw. Uh, Linnell, who do we have next on the line? Uh, next, I have Zach Vissera. Zach, go ahead. Uh, good morning, uh, Dr. Shaw and Ms. Garchinsky. I'm wondering if you can quantify how many surgeries have been canceled or postponed because of this surge planning, and if you can also speak to um, the cancellation or suspension of the Saskatchewan Organ and Tissue Donation Program. I'll start just to say I don't have the numbers of how many people across the entire province have had their surgery delayed. I think that's um, rapidly unfolding as the directive has come out to delay um, cases that are scheduled outside of the uh, cancer urgent and six week window. I will ask Lori to speak to the rest of your question because um, I've actually, I think I've actually lost what the question was. Sorry, Zach. That's okay. Hi, Zach. Um, thanks very much for the question. In the contemplation of service slowdown and um, human resource allocation, often our uh, organ donation coordinators are the ones that also come and have critical care experience. So due to the significant surge, particularly in Regina and Saskatoon, and the need to maintain those standards of care and support, we have um, slowed down and will uh, provide only immediate tissue donation, particularly for some of our ocular patients. We're just working through that process right now, but yes, uh, unfortunately that has been one of the 
side effects of the surge capacity management that we've had to do to support ICU care in the province. Thanks, Laurie. And Dr. Shazak, did you have a follow up? Yes, Ms. Karczynski, maybe just so I'm clear, does this mean that somebody who is registered to donate other organs um, and who passes away tragically for, for whatever circumstance, if that person comes in and they have viable organs, what happens to those organs right now? So, unfortunately, Zach, with um, the suspension of our program, it would mean that, unfortunately, that gift and that registration that um, they so kindly provided would not be able to come to fruition. We would continue to manage them and support them with end of life care, but um, we're very saddened as a province. There's been significant work done to manage the organ donation program, and we're super grateful for all the families and um, people of Saskatchewan who have made that decision to donate. Our resources, however, right now have to care for the um, intensive care patients that we're dealing with. Thank you, Lori. Uh, Linnell, uh, who do we have next on the line? I have a written question here from Phil Tank uh, that I will pose on his behalf. Uh, what are you expecting over the next two weeks in terms of hospitalizations and ICU admissions, and what effect will that have throughout the province? It's Derek here, and I'll just maybe take a stab at that one. Um, so, as I mentioned in the opening comments, we are still planning towards the uh, the targeted um, surge capacity that was that was shared last week, 125 COVID ICU um, beds, and also uh, 350 uh, non COVID acute care or non ICU, sorry, um, uh, acute um, beds for for COVID patients. Um, and so th those um, those capacity figures remain in place. Um, we are seeing um, fluctuating demand on a on a day to day basis, um, and so it's prudent for us to prepare for. Um, this, uh, this scenario, um, while we do have an understanding of, um, potential trends, um, we can't predict really what's going to happen in the next 2 weeks. We are seeing it as I mentioned, some, uh, increased demand in, in rural and in Regina. Um, and so we're, we're, I guess, changing and, and adapting to be able to, to meet that. Um, but ultimately, uh, we don't know what the, what the 2 week projection, um, might, might turn out to be. And, um, and I guess that's where it kind of comes back to our residents of Saskatchewan. Um, the, the key things that, that each of you can do if you're eligible um, and unvaccinated, you can get vaccinated. Um, and that's so vitally important to, to all of this. And, uh, and otherwise, uh, obey the, the public health orders, wear a mask, and, and carry out all those, those normal safety practices that we've adopted over the last many months. Thank you, Derek. Um, Linnell, who do we have next on the line? I'll just go back. Phil did have one follow up question in that, and it's are we close to needing help from outside the province as we saw with Alberta? Um, so I'll um, respond to that one as well. Um, so our intent right now is to um, activate our surge plans and, and all the various slowdowns, uh, redeploy our staff in order to achieve the capacity that's uh, been established for us. Um, as part of that, of course, we are looking for other potential contingencies, um, and we have normal processes where we we move patients um, out of province. For example, it's just that's a normal, um, I guess, way of of moving patients to where they um, can, can get the the care that they need. So we know that that um, that is an option, a contingency. Our, our plan right now, though, is to continue with um, the the surge activation that that is being mobilized as we speak. Um, in order to meet the, the demand. Thanks, Derek. Uh, Linnell, who do we have next? Uh, next, I have on the line, Nikki Jurek. Nikki, go ahead. Yeah, I'm here. Um, I understand that, you know, this number fluctuates, but what, how many people are in the ICU um, today for both COVID and non-COVID patients? Hi, Nikki, it's Lori. Um, I can tell you at present, um, our current capacity as of um, 1130 is 84 patients in the intensive care unit. 60 of those um, are in for COVID related admission. Thanks, Lori. Mickey, did you have a follow up? Yeah, we're starting to see, um, as you mentioned earlier in the statement, um, 
that you know hospitalizations in Regina are increasing and as is in the south um how what happens if Regina gets to a situation that Saskatoon sees itself in um and are we close to um you know having that surge capacity so I think Derek if, if it's all right I can start with that um I guess I can uh, tell you from the standpoint of critical care to uh, Derek comments that EOC has provided us a goal of 125 um, surge capacity spaces for uh, the province for ICU patients and then likely the additional 50 for some patients that uh, do not have COVID related admission. As Derek has mentioned, the service slowdown does allow us to redeploy staff, some who have critical care experience some who have been upskilled through the course of this pandemic. And we're just in the process right now of expanding those. There are, at this point in time in the province, 24 additional ICU surge beds that are open in um, our regional or in our tertiary sites. The goals and the conversations between um, the Emergency Operations Center and the local incident command groups in rural North Regina and Saskatoon continue to look from their expanded capacity as where they can go to next and what manpower strategies they would have to go to that. So we're not at that point in time yet where from a Regina rural standpoint, we do not have ICU capacity, but we are strained. Keeping in mind that this pandemic has been going on for a substantially um, long amount of time. And uh, I think there was a lot of hope for frontline folks and likely Saskatchewan residents as a whole that the vaccination campaign would, would get us out of this. Um, unfortunately, the challenge is still seeing unvaccinated admissions throughout the province continues to create stress and challenges for our frontline staff. And it does force us to move into additional surge spaces and capacity and management of care that um, is already strenuous on um, healthcare providers, physicians, respiratory therapists, folks that are actually just very, very tired. Thank you, Lori. Um, Linnell, who do we have next? Uh, next, I have Lara Fondema. Lara, go ahead. Lara, are you there? Lara, you're on. Hmm. Yes, I am. Thank you. Can you hear me okay? Yes, we can. Yep. Yeah. Okay, wonderful. Um, my question is, where are the employees, um, have the staff who've been redeployed to, uh, for instance, the PICU in, in Saskatoon or to ICUs uh, across the province, uh, where are they coming from and are they adequately trained to work in an ICU? Yeah, thanks so much very much, Laura, for your comment. Um, when we do our service deployments and service slowdowns, um, those staff and through our human resources look at the qualifications of the patient, of the uh, staff members that are actually put into the labor pool. We do have critical care trained staff who have left and pursued other opportunities within the SHA. So dependent upon um, the time frame that they have left the intensive care unit, it might be a short brush up, it, may, it might be some orientation and support going forward. We also have areas where there are um, either observation units, um, high acuity beds, opportunities where um, staff from other locations have had some level of experience. Over the course of the last 18 months, we have done a lot of work with upskilling some of those staff and allow them to come and help support the intensive care units. Compounded with that are the other areas that come with service slowdown. If you are a registered nurse, if you're a licensed practical nurse, if you're a respiratory therapist, you have a scope of practice that we are attempting to maximize to really provide an all-encompassing teamwork approach to this. So there are some staff that have been floated from some medical or surgical uh, units that may not necessarily have intense care support, but they do have a scope of practice. They do have an ability to provide health in terms of supporting for turning, repositioning, management of some appropriate medications, other care delivery methods that are within that level. And, really that work and multidisciplinary approach of, of dealing with a large number of patients is the way that we are supporting our surge capacity currently. Thank you, Lori. Lara, did you have a follow-up? 
I do. Yes, thank you. Um, there is, uh, I, I, I've asked the health ministry uh, an anticipated shortage of uh, some uh, COVID medication, anti inflammatory medication that's anticipated in a couple of weeks. How do you uh, potentially see that affecting uh, patient treatment, COVID uh, ICU patient treatment uh, in the coming weeks, given that uh, ICU capacity is, uh, has to be increased and there are more patients uh, in the ICUs every day? I can start with that. It's Susan. Um, so you're right, and I've spoken to this before. There are a few very selected group of therapeutic drugs that have been shown to show some impact on uh, the recovery course of people with a COVID infection. There's a high demand for those medications all around the world because of the pandemic and because we have so many people uh, with, with, with COVID infections. How the uh, drugs are allocated is done at a federal level with uh, allocations coming into the province. And then what we do is we work really hard with a team a therapeutics experts panel that looks at what are the criteria to make sure that the right people are getting the right medication for the right indication. And we have order sets, we have decision supports, we have um, tools available to physicians and pharmacists to make sure that we're using the medications appropriately really trying to make sure that it's used um, in the best way possible. If I want to order one of those medications, I have to actually consult with a pharmacist and together we make a decision as, is this the right drug for this patient? Is it safe? Is it likely to be effective? That's what we can do right now to make sure that we're making best use of a very precious resource. I do worry, and this is, you know, when you look at finite resources, um, the medication supply is something that is outside of our direct control, which again makes it even more important that everybody does everything they can to stay safe, to be vaccinated, to wear a mask, to avoid large gatherings, everything you can do so that you don't need one of these medications, because there is a potential. We could run out and that's the reality. We do everything we can to make sure we're not wasting the drug. And I'm very confident that the teams are making sure the drugs are used as best as possible, but we could run out. Thanks, Dr. Shaw. Uh, Linnell, who do we have next? Amanda, I'm gonna call on Alexander Kwan. Alexander, go ahead. Hi there, uh, I'm just wondering what the the path forward over the next couple of weeks looks like are things going to get better or are they going to get worse i'll say that um the demand that we're seeing in our hospitals right now including in our intensive care units it really is derived from the cases that we saw uh 10 to 14 days ago um, and so what we've seen um, since then is a continued increase in in cases per day and so based on that, we are anticipating our, our demand in our hospitals to continue to increase as well. Um, we are hopeful that the public health orders that have been introduced will uh, start to bend that curve and ultimately lead to a reduction in demand in our, in our facilities. But we are continuing to surge to increase um, our capacity, as, as mentioned earlier, in an anticipation of ongoing um, uh, growth in hospitalizations and an ICU census. So all of this really emphasizes the need for people to make the, the right choice about vaccination, um, to follow the public health orders, wear a mask and, and so on. Thanks, Derek. Alexander, did you have a follow up? Yeah, I just wanted uh, to follow up on a, a question about the, the pick you use. Uh, can you confirm that that there is COVID-19 patients currently at the, the PICU, or is it is it just other ICU patients that, that don't have COVID-19? Thanks very much for that question. Um, I can confirm uh, with you from an adult standpoint, there is one COVID-positive adult in the PICU, and there is one other adult that is admitted for another condition. As of 12.45 yesterday afternoon, there was one additional uh, PIC patient that was COVID positive at that point in time. The remainder of the patients in the pediatric ICU were there for a variety of other reasons. Thanks, Lori, for that. Um, Linnell, who do we have next on the line? Our next is Gabriella Panza Beltrandi. Gabriella, go ahead. Uh, yes, just following up a little bit on that, actually, um, with some children's ICU beds being reserved for adults. Um, does the SHA anticipate more children to be hospitalized in the next couple of weeks? 
uh, how will care for them be adjusted to meet demand stuff? How will that kind of work? Yeah, thanks so much, Gabriella, for your uh, question. So when there is consideration of um, an adult patient being placed in the pediatric ICU, there's a number of um, conversations and discussions that occur. Firstly, between the pediatric and the adult intensivist in terms of determining the appropriateness if that patient generally, a single system disease, um, has the ability to um, uh, be managed and supported in the PIC. Secondly, similar to what the adults do or a neonatal does, we look at our overall occupancy. How many patients are in the unit? How many patients would we be progressing to believe that they would have capacity to be transferred out? And what is our bed staffing along with HR resources? So it really is a combination um, of factors. It's not just a carte blanche that so many beds are designated for adults in the PIC. It is a case-by-case -case discussion, and it really is um, important to understand that, <clears throat> excuse me, the, um, the pediatric uh, ICU team, as well as I think the SHA as a whole, understands the responsibility for the management of uh, pediatric ICU care, and that will always be the first priority. Thank you, Lori. Uh, Gabriella, did you have a follow up? Uh, yes, I was just wondering uh, in Saskatchewan in general, how many kids currently are being treated for COVID-19 in hospital and are there unique challenges to cheat treating younger patients like uh, under 12 age? I, I, I don't have knowledge as an uh, adult. I see you doc about uh, how best to look after small children with COVID. And I think we'd be able to um, perhaps connect you with uh, somebody who is able to speak to that. And I don't know that Laurie or Derek would have anything to build on follow up question. Well, I can take that question away and touch base with you at a later date on that. Uh, I guess, Amanda, the one thing that I can, sorry, the one thing that I can just provide is the fact that I know we are looking at making that a bit more transparent on our dashboard and the ability to ensure that that information is available. Again, fortunately, um, up until recently, we have not had a significant amount of pediatric patients um, that have required PIC care. But I think as the teams are going forward and we're understanding this, we want to make that information transparent as well. Thank you, Lori. Uh, Linnell, who is next? I'll call on Lisa Schick. Lisa, go ahead. There, maybe now you can hear me. Yes, we um, can. Okay. Uh, we're hearing that doctors are quite concerned about the slowdown and the effect that it is having on their patients, especially given that uh, a lot of things weren't able to catch up after the last healthcare slowdown. Uh, just wondering how that and, you know, the fact things weren't able to catch up is factoring into decisions about care and the realities of people needing care in the province. I can start at Susan Shaw. Um, I think everybody is very concerned and I share the concerns that I've heard directly from many physicians about what the um, very large numbers of people in our hospitals that we need to care for immediately and plan for in the days ahead. The impact of that across the entire province is massive. And I think that's one of the main points that um, I tried to make in my comments when I went and I want to keep emphasizing this is whether you have COVID or not, we are slowing down services that are gonna impact you or somebody you know, not because we want to, but because we have no choice. We have people presenting um, with severe COVID and without their care, we, we know that they would not do well. They would uh, literally die and we don't have a choice. We have to be ready and able to look after those people, recognizing massive impact on the health and wellness of the rest of the province. That's why it's so important that we are all vaccinated. Everybody who is eligible needs to protect themselves from COVID and they need to protect the healthcare system so we can be there for you. Right now, we know that we're not there for everybody and it's no choice, we have no choice. Thanks, Dr. Shaw. Lisa, did you have a follow-up question for us? Yes. Um... 
at this point right now, I know um, you guys have said that you're kind of in the process of slowing things down, but at this point right now, which procedures are being stopped, uh, not being performed, and as we continue on, uh, which ones are also being taken off the table? Like, at what point are we in that slowdown? I'll maybe start off on this one. Um, so with the instructions that were provided last week to our teams, we are um, ceasing all elective um, surgeries and procedures. And so we are continuing to provide um, emergent cancer and um, six week urgent um, uh, surgeries and, and uh, procedures. Um, and so that's being implemented as we speak. So um, across the province, patients would be notified of those changes. Um, and then we, we, we would be taking the steps to redeploy staff to where we need them, such as the, the ICUs and in, in other um, COVID services. Um, so that's, that's in, in progress. I'll, I will also say there are many other services in the community in primary health care um, and, and other um, outpatient services that are also being slowed as part of this in order to um, free up staff so that they can be deployed um, perhaps into acute care, but then also into our testing sites um, to support vaccine contact tracing and and those types of COVID services in order to keep up with the demand. So, in addition to the um, I guess the, the surgical side, um, there are many services in the in the community um, that are also being um, slowed down in order to make sure that we have the resources available to meet the the COVID demand. I'm not sure if uh, Dr. Shaw or Lori have additional comments. Oh, I just like to build on that. The first one is that um, I think we all recognize that elective does not mean unnecessary. And so um, the word elective means that it doesn't need to be done emergently or urgently. So we really do worry a lot and recognize the, the burden this is creating on so many people. The other thing I want to emphasize is we are still here for you if you need urgent and emerging care. And I really don't want anyone to stay away if they think they're having a major illness or a sudden change in their health. Seek care, call 911. Uh, we want to be there. We are there for you. It's very safe to come in and have care inside our hospitals and our emergency rooms. Yes, we're busy, but we're focusing on people with acute and emergency services that need our care. So don't stay away. Uh, please be understanding that not all care is continuing. But our emergency and urgent care is is here for you. Thanks, Derek and Dr. Shaw. Um, do we have uh, any more questions on the line, Linnell? I have one last set of questions from Pat McKay. Pat, go ahead. Uh, thank you. Um, we had heard that uh, adults had been in the PICU at actually many different times in the pandemic. Maybe not consistently, but absolutely before this fourth wave. Can you confirm that? It's Susan, um, yeah, so I would say it's not many. I would say that intermittently since um, early 2021, uh, and Laurie, Laurie may have more details, uh, but since early 2021, uh, this has been a plan that's always been in the background. And intermittently, certainly the PICU has been incredibly helpful on a case by case basis, uh, taking um, primarily young adults that have single system or um, single system problems, meaning maybe it is just car collision or an infection or or COVID, a COVID infection and looking after them. So that's like, I don't have a number for you. Uh, I think it's been about three in the last kind of couple of weeks, but across the whole um, 2021 version of this pandemic that we've been through, the PICU has been very helpful on a case by case basis. Yeah, thanks, Dr. Shaw. I guess I would just add to that, you know, throughout the history of the PICU, when um, there have been young adults appropriate, there has been some admissions into the PICU to assist um, the adult team when they were nearing capacity. So um, I do just want to echo that, you know, we've all come together as a team to really help. And I think it, it's important to understand that, you know, there really was from a, a PIC perspective, keeping in mind, we must provide care for pediatric ICU patients. Um, you've heard us talk a little bit about service slowdown and deployment. There was a conscious decision not to deploy PICU nurses out of PICU for the, that very reason, to ensure that they are there and they are ready to care for PICU patients when required. However, as Dr. Shaw has mentioned, when there is some level of capacity, 
and there is an appropriate conversation and a selected patient population, they have been a huge part of our team to be able to care for um, additional COVID or non-COVID um, young individuals that may not have normally been in that ICU, but do take the load off of the adult ICU for all of those COVID and or non-COVID patients that we are asked to care for. Thanks, Laurie and Dr. Shaw. Uh, Pat, did you have a follow-up question? Yeah, just one, if you, if you were able to put a number on just how many adults have been in the PICU throughout the pandemic. Pat, it's, it, it's probably, yeah, it's probably difficult for me to give you an exact number. Um, I would say to you over the period of time, there's likely been less than 10. I would agree it's less than 10, but I don't have an exact number. Great, thank you for thank you both for that. Uh, I want to thank uh, the news media for uh, participating in this call today. And of course, to Derek Laurie and Dr. Shaw uh, for making the time for this. Um, that concludes our question and answer session for today, and we will now disconnect the call. Thank you.